Okay, church, have a wee seat, get comfortable. Good morning once again. If I missed you at the start, lovely to be with you today. Uh, what a gorgeous Glasgow sunny day. I hope you're all going to go for an ice cream straight after this service. But first up, I want to begin by blessing you this morning. So I'm just going to pray a prayer of blessing over you. I bless you in the name of Jesus to know him more wonderfully today to be healed in your body, your mind, heart, soul, wherever you need it this morning, to have peace and joy, whatever you are facing, and to know God's realness, goodness, and victory in everything. Amen. So I find myself reminiscing this week back to the start of summer, to the 1st of July. We had our leaders prayer meeting where we met in Rehope Royston with our staff, our elders, and people from our church across the different locations. And we spent some time praying for our church and listening to God. Now, Naomi Worth, who is one of our YA legends around here, she was with me and she was coming back in my car. And when the meeting ended, the ladies just through the door. You're going the right way. Naomi was in my car and she was coming home with me and on the way out of the meeting, she was like absolutely buzzing, like bouncing down the road, totally lit up, like she had just won an Olympic gold in prayer meetings. Why? Because we had spent an hour and a half in a little shop front in Royston and God had spoken to us. She was freshly in awe of the fact that as children of God, we get to hear his voice. Today is part two of our mini treasure series that we started last week, and it is a call to treasure the voice of God. The learning objective today is simply to treasure God's voice more, not to master hearing his voice more, but to treasure his voice more. And to expand on that, I pray that this church would be a place where we are learning to hear God's voice together, primarily, first and foremost, through the Bible, and then in every way that the Bible teaches us about and testifies to. Some of the ways are on the screen. There's more. I'm sure you could add to it. But today, I just want to lay a foundation that we can begin with or that we can come back to, a foundation of treasuring God's voice, because through his voice, he reveals his character and nature to us. Because through his voice, he reveals our value to him. And because with his voice, we have a firm foundation to build our lives upon. We have an anchor of truth and we have a rudder to direct us every day of our lives. Now, I am a how girl, not a cow girl, a how girl. In Glasgow, people say how to mean why. But when I say how, I mean how. How does this work? How do I hear God through dreams? How do I know that it's really him? I have all the how questions, and I have had all the how questions, and I would encourage you today, if you've got questions of how this works, send me an email, not because I have all the answers, but because I would actually really like to know what we would like to know. We've got a couple more weeks. Maybe we can look at some of these things, but email laura at rehope.co.uk. I would love to know your how questions if they rise up, but first, today, I want us to start with a heart check. It's not a how message, but it's more of a heart message today. And so I wonder on a scale of like zero to Naomi Worth skipping down the streets of Royston, how much do you treasure your ability to hear God's voice today? Most of us are probably somewhere in the middle of that scale, like a solid five or six. For some of us, maybe today we are thinking, I don't even know if I'm on that scale. I don't know if God speaks to me. I don't know why God would speak to me. For all of us, I would say, let's look at this through the gospel again today. We had no access. We could not touch the mountain of God. We could not touch the boundary of the mountain. We could not touch people who had touched the boundary of the mountain. Without Jesus, I cannot come close to God. But with Jesus, I am adopted into the family of God. Read Romans and just marvel at this amazing adoption that we've been given through Jesus and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Romans says those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. And in John chapter 1, in the Gospel of John, Jesus speaks out two invitations which then ring out throughout the whole Gospel time and time again. First he says, come and see. Come and see me. Come and see what I say. Come and see what I do. Come and see who I am. Do you believe in me? And then he says, come follow me. Now, for a lot of my life, I knew that to be a Christian was to follow Jesus, and I wanted to follow Jesus, 
but I had no clue how to follow Jesus because God felt so quiet. And I would read the Bible and it would be like coming up for air because I would find him there and words would jump off the page, but I didn't know how to apply what I was reading to the many ins and outs of my life. And God seemed so much more real in the stories of the Bible than he did in my day to day. And maybe there'd be like a spiritual high here or there, but there was no consistent thread of knowing God deeply. I saw people with a vibrant faith and it seemed like they were hearing from God somehow. They spoke to God and God spoke back. And I remember thinking, I don't know what that is that they have, but whatever they have, I don't seem to have access to that. If we believe that God is silent, then we will find things. Our heart will find things that we can hear and we will follow those things. And I definitely did that. I followed my friends. I followed my feelings. I followed godly people sometimes. I followed ungodly people sometimes. I followed the great cultural conveyor belt of life until I found myself aged 23, totally exhausted, clinging on, and facing the greatest crossroads moment probably of my life to date. Because in front of me was something I thought I wanted more than anything in my entire life. And yet the Spirit of God in me was saying no. This is not for you. This is not what I have for you. I don't know if you've ever been in one of those testing seasons where you feel like you're being torn in two. It's so uncomfortable. And looking back now, I can see that it was God's grace to amplify his voice for me to a point where even though I didn't recognize that it was him speaking, I could not ignore him speaking. And I'm convinced that hearing Jesus in that season changed the whole trajectory of my life because it led me to say no where I needed to say no. It led me to say yes where I needed to say yes. And it was completely his grace to me. And about a year later, it would lead me to a little place called Rehope Church, where with some friends and some amazing leaders, I would learn to hear God's voice for myself for the first time in my life in a way that not only like rescued me out of a confused and swirling season where I felt pretty lost, but also in a way that would change my walk with God forever from being something where I was constantly like coming up for air and then like grasping around in the dark to something where I actually felt like a consistent thread of his leadership and presence in my life. And now I have a conviction that beyond the message of the gospel, learning to hear God's voice, learning to treasure God's voice is perhaps the greatest treasure that we can find in life. And the sooner we find it and the greater we treasure it, the less time we will spend lost and swirling in the noise of other voices. When I discovered this, I had the same revelation that had Naomi Worth like bouncing down the streets of Royston. I had the same revelation that Reuben Komalafi testified to last week when he said, um, the, the worship song, So Will I, God repeated that for him. And hearing God through that, it was like, okay, God is real. God loves me. I heard God's voice and I was like, God is real and God loves me. And we have to start there. We have to start in our foundation being like, okay, God's voice takes me to his character and his nature. It reveals his character and his nature. And that is why we treasure it first and foremost. It's easy for our hearts to turn the other way around, for our love for God to become conditional on what he's doing rather than rooted in his character. For example, we start to love God because he answers prayer rather than loving answered prayer because we love him, the God who answers prayer. Or I start to love God because he speaks to me rather than loving his voice because I love him. And I have found that seasons in my life where maybe God is a little quieter or seasons of waiting, it doesn't take very long for that to be highlighted if my heart has turned the wrong way. We treasure God's voice because it reveals a glorious God. The God who was revealed to us in Jesus, the image of the invisible God described in Colossians. It says, through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see, the things we can't see. Everything was created through him and for him, and he holds all creation together. This is the God who speaks to us. And it's a loop, too, because knowing his voice leads us to know his character, but knowing, trusting in his character will lead us to his voice. Why is on the other hand, the reverse works too. If we misunderstand God's character, it can lead us away from his voice in ways that are really harmful and unpleasant. We see this in the book of Jeremiah. God's people have turned to false gods and God is full of grief, but he hasn't sprung out of nowhere for them. God reveals through Jeremiah the heart of the people because they're crying out, the Lord doesn't see what's ahead for us. 
The Lord doesn't see what's ahead for us. And so in the unknown, looking for a way forward, they have turned to things that cannot see, cannot hear, cannot help. Now, we can all probably relate to moments in our life where we've looked ahead and we're like, I don't see the way forward. And in those moments, do we trust in God's character in a way that will draw us to seek his voice and his direction? Or honestly, do we trust in other voices more? If you believe a lie about who God is today, if I believe a lie about who God is and his ability or desire to guide me in life, then trying to treasure his voice is going to be like trying to fill a leaky bucket. I'm just going to be hemorrhaging out the side until that lie is dealt with. Do you believe that God can be trusted to guide and direct your life? Now, um, camping a few weeks ago, I, uh, this was my best friend. I never thought I'd be the object lesson person, but here we are. Maybe there'll be more. Um, this is my best friend. I ordered like eight of these to go camping with the teenagers a few weeks ago because uh, I learned the hard way that you need this. You know, toilet in the middle of the night. You need this. Um, teens, are they in their tents at the end of the night? Can I go to bed yet? Yes, Beth's cheering, but I needed this. Need to have a little like late night conversation with a night warden? You need this. Essential, totally essential. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. I used to think that Jesus being the light in the darkness was like Jesus is the goodness in the badness. But in this part of John, he's saying, I am the way to truly see. I am the light that leads to life. When it comes to God's character, we celebrate a lot here. We'll have seen it at the start of our service. We love to talk about God being a God who answers prayer. And that is a good part of God's character to celebrate because as you pull on that string, you just get like more goodness. You get his faithfulness, you get his care, you get his kindness, you get his goodness, his power. I think treasuring God's voice has power to expand our vision of God being a God who answers prayer. Because there may be unanswered prayers in my life. And that there might be things where circumstances have not changed yet or provision has not come through yet. And yet I have felt challenged by God in recent days, recent years, to expand my vision of what it means for him to answer prayers. Because if God has spoken to me, he's not left me unanswered in the way that maybe I once would have imagined. Now sometimes you might be in a season, you might be in something that just feels totally dark. And if that's where you are today, I'm so sorry but I wonder if more times than we recognize, Jesus is ready to be a very real light in the darkness, our good shepherd caring for us and leading us through by his voice, even in the dark valleys and the unknowns, the not yets, the not ideals of our life. Point number two today is that we treasure God's voice because it tells us who we are. Okay, now, where are my fellow voice noters in the room? I know that you're right there, Mia Kumalafi, yes, April, yes, okay, we got a few voice noters. We are more than you would think, and we are multiplying, so have hope. I love a voice note. I love a voice note. And see, when a friend sends me a voice note, I'm like, okay, wow, like, they, they actually like me. Like, they actually like me. See, when a friend who doesn't, who, like, notoriously complains about voice noters sends you a voice note, I'm like, wow, they love me. The fact that they would share their thoughts with me, the fact that they would take the time, you open up WhatsApp, you open that conversation, you see, you know, like so-and-so is recording. You're like, yes, this is incredible. They're my friend, they love me. I feel so valued, so honored, so seen. The freedom journey of my life has been to let God disconnect my sense of my own value from anything that I can do, produce, or achieve. So imagine my delight when I discovered that God loved me enough to speak to me and I didn't need to do anything to earn it. When Naomi skipped through Royston, her amazement that God would speak to us is echoed, um, it echoed David's awe in Psalm 8. He says, Lord, your glory is higher than the heavens. What are mere mortals that you should think about them, human beings that you should care for them? In Bible read-through just this week, the angel Gabriel says to Daniel in chapter 9, you are very precious to God. And the context for this is that Daniel has been reading God's word in Jeremiah. He's been reading about God's coming 
judgment, which was just, and he turned to God in desperate prayer for himself and for his people. And in response, it says, God sends an angel to him to give him insight and understanding. He says, the moment you began praying, a command was given. And now I'm here to tell you what it was, for you are very precious to God. The moment Daniel began to pray, God was like, send a message. Go, Gabriel. God saying, you are very precious to me, Daniel. If you doubt your value, would you dare to join me today in taking the reality of a God who wants to speak to you as significant evidence that you are very precious to him? Not to puff ourselves up, but to walk in the truth that reveals his goodness. A God who is mindful of the people that he has made. And not only mindful of us, but wants to tell us who we really are, which we really need to hear, because I'll set us free. Jesus calls the enemy the father of lies, and his first lie recorded in Genesis is rooted in distrust of God's voice. He says, did God really say that you must not do that? And then listening and living out of that lie is what leads humanity away from God and away from the freedom and the life he offers. So it shouldn't amaze me as much as it does the power of choosing to trust in what God has said to bring freedom and to bring life. Many of us will have at one point, or maybe even still, battled with voices that provoke fear, shame, rejection, maybe all three, maybe different things. If you've ever struggled with something like self-hatred, you'll know that there was probably external voices, there was probably internal voices that fed that lie in your life. You were told things, and eventually you believed them. If we're like a plant, then these lies are like weeds that grow up around us and choke us and block us from the light. And the thing is, these can grow quickly in our life. I, I went, walked home the other night, just last night, and I said to Sophie, my flatmate, I was like, what? like there's a tree in our garden now. But it's not a tree, it's a weed. It's just grown in like a week from nothing to massive. These weeds can grow so quickly in our lives. And yet the truth that God speaks is like weed killer and it's like water. It will kill those weeds in our life like nothing else will. And it will also water us so we will grow, so that we will thrive in what is true and find life. Psalm 100 tells us that God made us, we know this, God made us and we are his, the sheep of his pasture. And we were always made to know who we are in relation to who he is. The Bible will tell us that and then the Holy Spirit will remind us of that every day for the rest of our lives if we let him. In Exodus, we see Moses, he's like, I'm a clumsy speaker, I don't know why you would call me to do this thing, like look at who I am. And God says, who made your mouth? I am the Lord and I will go with you. And Judges, an angel of the Lord appears to Gideon and calls him a mighty hero before the battle is won, while Gideon is still thinking, I'm the least in my family, I'm the weakest in my clan. Jeremiah himself testifies to how before he was born, God called him and set him apart to be a prophet to the nations. I don't want to live out of what people called me once. I don't want to live out of what I'm tempted to believe about myself on my worst days. I want to live out of the truth of who God says that I am. One final why. Why do we treasure God's voice? We treasure God's voice because it gives us a firm foundation on which to build our lives. We read about this in Luke chapter 6. Jesus says, I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me, listens to my teaching, and then follows it. It's like a person building a house who digs deep and lays the foundation on solid rock. When the floodwaters rise and break against that house, it stands firm because it was well built. But anyone who hears and doesn't obey is like a person who builds a house right in the ground without a foundation. When the floods sweep down against that house, it will collapse into a heap of ruins. We see here, okay, it's not enough to hear God's voice, even to like master hearing his voice. We will build deep wells of trust with God as we hear and obey, hear and obey. A faith that survives heartbreak will start as we hear and obey today. A faith that survives loss will start as we hear and obey today. We don't do it to earn love. We don't do it even to build a nice house. We do it to build a life with God that will withstand a storm. A life where before a storm, middle of the storm, after a storm, maybe even with tears in our eyes, we will say, Jesus, you are Lord. Because as we obey, we abide in him. And we see how trustworthy he is to lead us through. So I was mentioning, um, I was at Magnitude a few weeks ago with 25 teenagers. Um, a few of us were. 
And I can tell you, I've never felt more like a sheepdog in all of my life. It'll be like half an hour until the main session starts, and we'd be like, okay, right, let's, uh, let's begin to like herd the sheep into the pen, and we'd kind of like get around, and we'd herd the sheep in, we'd count the sheep, several would be missing, we would send off shepherds to go search for the sheep, we'd come back in, we'd get back around them like sheepdog again, and then we would like herd them up the hill to the big sheepfold, the big tent. Now, good news is that our God is not a sheepdog. He's not on the edges of your life, pushing and pressing that you might go in the right direction. Jesus connects his care and leadership of us to that of a shepherd to sheep, which means he is leading us by his voice. In John 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me. He says the sheep recognize the shepherd's voice and come to him. He walks ahead of them and they follow him because they know his voice. So how do we begin to treat Jesus like a shepherd and not like a sheepdog in our lives? I see the significance of readiness and recognition. So in 1 Samuel, we see young Samuel learning to hear and recognize the voice of God, which is good because he's going to become a prophet to the nations. He is a good example to us that a ready heart is a willing and submitted heart because he says that line that now is famous to us. He says, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And we might quote that in listening prayer, we might say that, but it is good to check, okay, do I mean that when I say that? Or am I saying, speak, Lord, I'm ready to hear you? Or am I saying, speak, Lord, I'm ready to serve you? In John 7, Jesus says, my message is from God. Anyone who wants to do the will of God will know whether my teaching is from God or merely my own. Here he connects our discernment, our ability to know what is from God with a willingness to want to do the will of God. Readiness looks like readiness to obey, and the only thing that seems to be better than readiness to obey is readiness to obey quickly. We see two examples, two great examples in the gospel, I'm sure there's many more, of people taking Jesus quickly at his word. One of those is in John chapter 4. Jesus is literally, um, John's just recorded Jesus talking about how the people just want signs and wonders, like they're obsessed with signs and wonders. They won't believe unless they see a sign and wonder, and then this government official comes to Jesus, like next breath, next moment. He comes to Jesus, and he begs Jesus to come and heal his dying son. And Jesus tells him, go home, your son will live. And it says, the man believed what Jesus said and started home. No sign, no wonder. He believed what Jesus said, and he started home. He gets home, and he discovers that his son was healed at the exact time that Jesus spoke In Luke chapter 7, a Roman centurion sent messengers to beg Jesus to heal his servant. But before um, Jesus arrives at his house, he sends word to him. He says, I'm not worthy of you coming to my home. Just say the word from where you are, and my servant will be healed. Jesus is amazed, and he says, I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. Faith that gets God's attention seems to be faith that says, I will take you quickly at your word. In Romans 12, Paul pleads with the church, give your bodies to God as a living and holy sacrifice. Don't copy the world, but let God transform you by changing the way that you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. I've heard some people say before, if you want to hear God speak, come to him with a yes. Come to him with a yes. And immediately, maybe the little like flags, the little alarms go off in our mind where we're like, you know, well, it kind of depends what he says. <laughs> but to come like a servant, to come wanting to do his will, to come where we said, God, I give you my body, I give you my mind, transform me. That is being ready in a way that is bigger than, okay, I'm ready to like do that one thing you're going to tell me, Lord. That is a life posture of yes and not yes, but, and not yes, later, or yes, maybe, or yes, if, but yes. Now, today is a heart check moment, and for some of us, maybe we're like, honestly, I'm not there. Like, I'm not at the point where I'm ready to give God the yes to anything he might say, and that's okay. The invitation of the Spirit for you today might be that first invitation, come and see, come and see. Jesus, read the Gospel of John. What does he say about himself? What did he do? Come and see. Who do you believe that he is? And then maybe again he'll say, okay, come follow me. Some of us think we're ready to hear and obey. We're like, okay, God, I'm ready. Do you want me to go this way or that way? 
And I was struck in my most re- recent go through Bible read through of how often, like through the Old Testament and into the New Testament as well, we see Jewish people casting lots to discern God's direction in a particular circumstance. It happens quite a lot. I hadn't noticed it before. They would be like, okay, God, here's the different options, or here's the different people. They would cast lots, and then they would know that this was God's direction for the way forward. And it was a really normal cultural practice. It makes a lot of sense that they did it that way. I wonder if for us, though, we ever, like, in our heart of hearts, we treat hearing God's voice a little bit like we're casting lots, where we're like, okay, God, like, do you want me to do this or that? Do you want me to go here or there? Date this person or date that person? Say yes or say no? X or Y? And it's okay to ask God questions. It is good to ask God questions, but we don't want to get to a place where we have boxed him in, where actually we're not open to hearing him say anything. We're not open to hearing and obeying anything, but we're kind of open to him picking one of our options. True readiness is readiness to hear and quickly obey whatever Jesus says to us. The next thing is recognition. Because we can be ready till the cows come home, but if we don't recognize that God's speaking to us, then we're not going to get very far. It took Samuel a minute to recognize that it was God speaking to him. First up, he thought it was something totally normal. It says in scripture that he was literally, he was sleeping in the tabernacle. I hadn't noticed that properly until this time reading through. He was sleeping in the tabernacle. He was like next to the ark of God. As close as really physically you could be to the incarnate presence of God as it was possible to be at that time. He's sleeping there. God calls out to him two times, and two times he thinks it is his human master, Eli, calling him. Eli then has to help Samuel understand that actually the voice he's hearing is the voice of the Lord. I relate to Samuel. I remember hearing people talk about hearing God, and I thought, oh, they must be hearing something totally supernatural sounding. Like, they must be hearing, like, a booming voice. They must be seeing these pictures in a way that's just totally, obviously supernatural. This is something that I am definitely not seeing or experiencing in my life. I had no expectation that God would speak to me through something that might feel normal. Surely it's too normal that God would speak to me through a book, even though it feels like the words are jumping off the page to me. Surely it's too normal that God would speak to me through nature, through people, through music, even though he made all of those things. Surely it's too normal that God would speak to me through my thoughts, even though these thoughts actually don't seem to be anything like my thoughts. I look at Samuel and we see he's sleeping right beside the ark of God, and God is speaking to him, and we're like, ah, Samuel, two times he thought it was Eli, how silly is Samuel? I lived for years with the spirit of the living God in me, yet thinking I did not hear him in any way. The first step in recognizing the voice of Jesus is to simply know and expect that you will hear him. And then you'll grow to recognize his voice as we grow to recognize anyone's voice in relationship over time. Sometimes we need an Eli. Sometimes we need someone in our life who will say, you know, your Bible read-through shares, like that's you hearing from God. You're praying, Holy Spirit, would you highlight things to me? Your Bible read-through shares, are you hearing from God? You know that thing that you thought was your idea? I don't actually think that's your idea. I think you're hearing from God. Recognizing Jesus' voice is not a special spiritual gift, but it is the right and the role of a sheep in relation to a shepherd. So I've said already, this is not the how-to message. We don't have time for it to be, but a quick glance back at some of the ways that God speaks. This is from the Bible. How do we know that it's him? That might be a question that comes up pretty quickly. We test it by the Bible first and foremost. We test it by the character and nature of Jesus. In Hebrews chapter one, it says, in these days, Jesus, uh, God has spoken to us through his son. And we do that in community. We don't go off on our own. And then what do we do with it? If we hear God speak in humility, we ask the Holy Spirit, what do you want me to do with this? But I would also say not to overthink it today. Like most cases, it's probably walk in it. If God speaks, he probably wants you to do that. He probably wants you to ask him for that. He probably wants you to step out in that way. It's probably an invitation to walk in it. Now, there's so much more we could say, but in summary, before our challenge, we want to treasure God's voice because it reveals his character and nature to us. It tells us who we are. It tells us our value in him, and it gives us a firm foundation to build our lives upon. The challenge is really simple. If you have questions, 
Email me, again, not because I have the answers, but because I would love to know what we would like to know when it comes to hearing God's voice and treasuring his voice. And secondly, go up for prayer today. Let us pray for you today if you would like to hear him more. A little bonus content, some possible responses today, I wonder. For some of us, it might be, okay, I feel like I'm right at the start of a journey of learning to hear God's voice. And if that's where you're at, I would say, especially, especially, like cling to the ink. Pick up the Bible, open the Bible, and cling to it. Not that any of us should set it down, but especially if you're like at the start of learning to hear God's voice, like you cannot overplay the Bible's significance in your life and knowing his character and his nature and how to discern what is from him. Maybe you're here today and you're like, I've kind of boxed God in in terms of how he speaks to me. I've not really expected that he would speak to me in any way except this way or in any way except the ways that I've experienced before. And maybe for you, there's just an invitation to, with your friends, with your Bible read through group, be like, okay, guys, how do you hear God speak? How do we see this happen through scripture as we read through the Bible together, like highlighting the ways that you see happen to people in scripture and praying and asking God, could this still happen today? Is this still the way that you want to speak to me? Could you speak to me that way, please? For some of you, you may be like, I've heard God's voice and I've not obeyed. There's something in my life where I have heard God and I've not done it yet, where it's been maybe like a yes, but, or a yes, if, or a yes, maybe, or a yes, when. In that case, I would say it's time, friend. It is time to hear and obey. Now, the learning objective today was that we treasure the voice of God more. And that's not a a head thing. That's not a head knowledge thing, but that's something that the Holy Spirit has to do in us. So I want to pray for us, but I also want us to pray together. And I have four simple prayers that are going to be on the screen that we can pray through um, just one at a time. Maybe they're not on the screen. No, they are. Great. We're going to just pray through these things. Have a look at them right now. You don't need to pray any of these. You can pray some of them. You can pray all of them. You can pray out loud. I'll pray out loud. You can pray quietly. But I just pray right now, Holy Spirit, come and help us. Lord, where we have a hunger, where we have a desire to treasure your voice more, would you come and would you meet us? And would you come and do that? Come and transform us. Holy Spirit, come. Lord, it's not in our strength. It's not by the strength of our will, but God, we do come with our hunger, we come with our desire, we come with our choice. And we say, Lord, Help us to treasure your voice because we want to treasure you. And we want to walk in line with you. We want to know you as our shepherd. We want to hear your voice and follow you, Jesus. So now I'll just pray one of these at a time and you can repeat after me. I'll pray them um, both times so you won't be heard loudly. First prayer is, God, I need your voice in my life. God, I need your voice in my life. I want your voice in my life. I want your voice in my life. I choose to treasure your voice in my life. I choose to treasure your voice in my life. I will hear and obey your voice in my life. I will hear and obey your voice in my life. Holy Spirit, help us. Help us to tune our ear, Lord, in a noisy world with noisy lives. Help us to tune our ear to your voice. Help us to find you. Help us to know you, where you're speaking to us already. Help us to even look back and see how you have been speaking to us through our lives. And God, I pray for anyone right now who just maybe does feel like lost in the noise of it all. Lord, I pray for a quiet and a stilling and a calm on the inside, Lord. Pray for other voices to be stilled in the name of Jesus, to be silenced in the name of Jesus, where we need to just hear you. And I pray for anyone today who, God, they look at you and actually, like, if they're honest in their heart of hearts, they don't know that they can trust you fully. They don't feel like they can trust you fully when it comes to your ability or your desire to lead them forward through whatever they're facing, or just in life in general. And I pray, God, would you come in your grace, in your mercy. Would you reveal your goodness, reveal your care, and give them the strength today by the Holy Spirit to trust in you fully, to choose to trust in you fully. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.